so much, Chris, for being here today. Uh, welcome to If You Lived During the Plymouth Thanksgiving with Chris Newell. My name is Bethany Graf Durow. I'm the Executive Director of the Museum of Old Newbury, and it's my pleasure to be part of the volunteer team of the Newburyport Literary Festival. This is our 17th year of bringing authors and readers together. This is the second day of our festival. It is my great honor and pleasure to introduce Chris Newell. Chris Newell is the co-founder and director of education for Agamo Educational Initiative, a majority native owned educational consultancy based in Connecticut and author of Scholastics, if you live during the Plymouth Thanksgiving, which we will discuss today. He's a multi award winning museum professional born and raised in Madak Magook, which is Indian Township, Maine, and a proud citizenship of the Passamaquoddy tribe at Indian Township. He also serves on the board of trustees for the New England Museum Association, Tides Institute, and Maine Public. Chris is a longtime singer with the acclaimed Mystic River Singers based out of Connecticut and has traveled the United States and Canada singing and participating in cultural celebrations, powwows, and live stage performances. Chris was the senior advisor for the Emmy Award winning documentary Don Land and co director of the short documentary. I'm so sorry, I practiced this. <laughs> Wetchkabwabuk, Wetchkabwabuk, did I do that okay? I'll let you say it when you come on. <laughs> Which is The Approaching Dawn, a short documentary film chronicling a, historic, a historic sunrise concert celebration and collaboration in 2021 with Wabanaki musicians and storytellers and 18 time Grammy winning cellist Yo-Yo Ma. What an amazing event and uh, welcome Chris. Thank you so much for being here. All right. Thank you so much, Bethany. Thank you so much, Bethany, for that introduction. Um, I, I realize that uh, reading my bio is oftentimes uh, difficult for English speakers. Um, and uh, Bethany was uh, very gracious in, uh, you know, really working to uh, get pronunciations right and everything. A lot of it is written in Passamaquoddy syllabics, um, which are, don't match uh, English language syllabics. And so it is kind of uh, difficult. Um, I am a co-founder of Agamal Educational Initiative. I'm the director of education, uh, which started in 2018. I am a former education supervisor for the Pequot Museum, which is actually where a lot of the material, um, where I started researching the material for this book, correct? And uh, also former executive director of the Abbey Museum in Bar Harbor, Maine, which is a museum focused on Wabanaki cultures, arts, and histories uh, in Maine's only Smithsonian affiliate. Um, back to working with Agamont full-time, and as you heard from my bio, uh, I tend to be busy in a lot of different areas. The work of Agamont Educational Initiative is really about bringing Native content into all areas of education in a culturally competent fashion, whether it's K-12 through schools, colleges, universities, museums are our forte, but we also work in media, you know, so I've, I've done some documentary work with my partners at the Upstander uh, Project on Dawnland, as uh, well as as a new short documentary, which we'll be showing at the Brattle Theater at three o'clock this afternoon. If you're in the Cambridge area, come on over to see the Reciprocity Project films where you'll see one of the seven films, Wetchkuwabuk, The Approaching Dawn, which is about a collaboration that myself and several other Wabanaki performers did with Yo-Yo Ma in Acadia National Park on June 18th of 2021. So let's get to the book though. That's why we're here, right? If you lived during the Plymouth Thanksgiving. Um, so this is a project that came to me from Scholastic. Now, I, I want to preface this by saying that I have never written a book before, you know, so the label of author still feels really new to me, although I do have a published book. So I guess I should probably accept it at this point. I tend to just define myself as an educator. That's that's the, the, uh, the crux of all of the work that I do is really surrounded around education. And that's a, a family business, I guess you could say, something I learned from my father who got a master's in education from Harvard University way back in 1971 and uh, worked throughout our entire lives, working to preserve our language, culture, and history. And education was really the road for him and something that he passed along to me as well. We, we are gonna be seeing, I'm seeing a few comments popping up on my screen. We are gonna be seeing some of the inside. I'm gonna be reading a little bit to 
you. I just wanted to describe the project a little bit. Scholastics, if you live books or if you books, I, you know, it's really, they're not all if you live, but if you, this series began back in the 70s and they, they wrote a whole series of them. They were very popular and have been, continue to be popular in museum stores, especially, but as school libraries, other places, it's really the idea of these books is to, you know, give a, a sort of immersive experience into what life would be like during certain historical periods. And this is a revamp of that series. And this was the first of the revamp. There's several others coming down the pipe from Scholastic that have to do with various other topics. And in fact, I have another uh, book on, an, on another historical uh, subject that'll be coming out for them in the next year uh, in this series as well. Written by myself with the help from tribal, uh, Quinna tribal, Wampanoag tribal elder Linda Coombs, who was our subject matter expert. I'm a Passamaquoddy, and this history centers the Wampanoag and the English interaction in what we now call Plymouth in 1620. And so, as a non Wampanoag, I wanted to make sure that everything that I was putting in there was culturally competent, was correct. Thankfully, Linda specializes in working with material like this, and she was able to really add a lot of detail to it. It is 95 pages. It is meant for grade second to five. As you can probably imagine, it's not really meant to be read from cover to cover in one session. It's a very informative book. The first book was called If You Live During the First Thanksgiving. And that's something that I get into in the material in the book, how that event, that feast in 1621, became to be known later in the 19th century as the first Thanksgiving, right? Where did that title come from? That's actually covered in the material in the book. One of the questions I often get just by looking at the title is the spelling of Plymouth. I use a spelling that was common back in the 17th century. And this is one of the little learning things. When I talk about the English folks, I really, you know, center uh, Wampanoag people in their own history. But when I talk about the English colonists, I try to talk about them using their own language of their time. And the English language of the 17th century was not standardized in spelling. We spell the town of Plymouth, P-L-Y-M-O-U-T-H, yet we don't pronounce it Plymouth right? We pronounce it Plymouth. And this is an example of why. This is a phonetic spelling that was used by William Bradford, among other spellings uh, that were used back at that time period. And so by getting rid of the first Thanksgiving in the title, we kind of unwind some of this truth to a meaning in this feast, but there's a misnomer that it was the first of such celebrations at the time. And these are all things that I wanted to really work on. I wanted to make sure that I was creating a resource that Wampanoag people would be proud to be able to share with others because living in Connecticut and Mashantucket for so long, I've gotten to know the Wampanoag people ever since I was 18 years old, 30 years of interaction with those communities. And I know just from the people that work at the Plymouth Patuxent Museum, formerly uh, Plymouth Plantation Museum, the ones that work in the Wampanoag Village there will get on a daily basis surprise that they still exist. Right. And that's one of the things that, uh, unfortunately, the American public school system has been doing with the foundational mythology of things like the first Thanksgiving narrative since the 19th century is really feeding an implicit bias that many tribes, especially on the East Coast, are all dead and gone. And in 2022, uh, 2022 adults, as well as their children, will end up having an awkward interaction with Wampanoag, living Wampanoag people. Uh, and for Wampanoag people, this is an all too common interaction. And so I really wanted to create something that Wampanoag people would be proud to say, this is a great starting point to start to learn about this particular point in history. It is important that we know all about it, you know, because it is a, a, a touch point that is so famous within the, the teaching of American history. But I wanted to widen the lens out beyond the feast itself, which is highly mythologized. It did happen in 1621, but there is so much more to the story. There were events that happened before the landing of the Mayflower. There was another colony that existed, Virginia, that would predates the Massachusetts colonies, uh, amongst other things. And then there's the after effects of colonization that also affected the Wampanoag people. So, so it ended up being 95 pages. But the way it is written out is almost like chaptering. The chapters are questions. I'll read a, a few of the questions for you here. So 
the table of contents would read number one, introduction, number two, what was the Mayflower voyage, number three, when and where did the Mayflower land, number four, what is a colony and who is a colonist. So as you can see, as you go through the material, if a student wanted to look up a particular piece of the history that we're talking about in this book, they could simply look up the question, turn to that page and find a short paragraph or two about that particular topic. And that is a structure of all the book that Scholastic creates. We can go to the next slide, please. All right, so before we get to uh, showing you some of the inside of the book and reading some of it to you, I just wanted to introduce you the illustrator. This is Winona Nelson. She is an Ojibwe, Leech Lake Ojibwe illustrator living uh, currently in the city of Philadelphia. And this was her first book project. She actually invented a style of art for the book. So you saw the artwork on the cover there. That is Winona's art. So this was her comment when she created it on her blog post. I've gone and created an illustrated uh, a children's book. This was my first kid's book and was deeply meaningful to me. If, if you're interested in a retelling of the history of how Thanksgiving came to be a national holiday that includes a native perspective for readers grades two to five or anyone older interested in a good overview, you can order Scholastics if you live during the Plymouth Thanksgiving by Chris Newell from your local independent bookstore. It has received a starred review from Kirkus Review and the School Library Journal. The artwork is done in 9B pencil with digital watercolors, a technique I developed working on my personal comic project. During her work in illustrating the book, sadly, her father passed away and she was able to finish the project. It's an homage to her dad. She says, I snuck my dad into the book. He's in the parade in the last spread wearing a baseball cap above the letter D. I just wanted to make sure to bring her in the picture. When it, when it comes to the creation of the content, my writing of it, Linda Coombs' involvement as subject matter expert, and Winona Nelson as illustrator. This was really a native created project uh, amongst multiple fronts that once again really centered the Wampanoag people in their own history. So here's some of the inside of the book for you here. And as I mentioned, the artwork just beautifully done. And it is so historically accurate in, in so many ways. And it really flows nicely throughout the book. Even though there's a lot of text in there, the artwork really drives home a lot of the points. And, you know, I give it up to Winona for really doing her homework. As an Ojibwe person, she was, uh, had, to, had to do a lot of studying of Wampanoag 17th century clothing, uh, how fishing wares looked, how the dugout canoes looked amongst other things. And she really nailed it. And so there is so much historical accuracy in the beautiful artwork that is created. And this is an example of inner pages of the book. Um, this is one of the questions I'll read to you really quickly, and then I'm gonna move on to some of the other ones. But one of the questions, what was the Mayflower voyage? The Mayflower wo voyage was the journey of English colonists on a ship called the Mayflower in 1620. The passengers intended to establish a new plantation in the English occupied colony of Virginia, 500 miles south of Plymouth. The Virginia colony was controlled by the Virginia Company and was settled in 1607. This voyage was originally made up of two ships, Captain Christopher Jones Mayflower of London was the cargo ship that set off alongside a boat called the Speedwell. Both were bound across the Atlantic Ocean in 1620. Shortly after they began their journey, the Speedwell sprang a leak that required repair. Both ships returned to England, but the repairs were slow and took nearly a month. After they departed again, another leak opened on the Speedwell. It was late in the year, and with no time to wait for repairs, passengers and supplies on the Speedwell were transferred to the Mayflower. The Mayflower set sail again by itself in September, carrying 102 passengers and 48 to 50 crew members, as well as supplies and cargo. The voyage lasted 66 days. And then as a little side note, as a did you know here, under the reign of King James I in England, there were 26 ships named the Mayflower in English port books. To distinguish them from one another, they were often referred to by their captain or owner or their home port, right? So historically, we often talk about the Mayflower as the Mayflower, um, yet 
the way it was originally written, it would have been titled in the logbooks as Captain Christopher Jones Mayflower of London. To, to distinguish it from the other uh, Mayflower ships, which was just a very popular name of the time. This is focusing right now on the English, but I'm going to be getting into some of the Wampanoag side and also talking uh, a little bit later at the end past uh, the event and into modern day times. I like to bring things into the present whenever I do a project on history, you know, and make sure that we write about Wampanoag peoples in the present. But this is another one, oftentimes write about uh, you know, the, the founding of America on the ideas of uh, religious freedom and just freedom in general. And there's truth. I'm not going to, you know, uh, uh, diminish that whatsoever. But there's also other reasons, um, you know, that the, uh, the English colonists were coming to America. And to be complete and inclusive of all of it, we really got to understand all of the motivations of what they were doing. Why would they get lost heading for Virginia, land way late? and try to make it here with all of the crazy conditions. And so this is a, a, a section where I really dig into that. Why did English colonists come to America? The artwork that goes along with it here. Um, every European colonist came to America for different reasons. Many were motivated by the idea of creating new lives. Forming colonies also expanded the wealth of European countries as well as their influence on the world. Like other European countries, the English wished to gain control of all indigenous lands in the Americas, including any resources in the land that held values such as timber or furs. In England, people owned plots of land and worked those plots to make their resources. Having land did not only mean raising crops for food, it also meant making, quote, improvements, unquote. And I use that in specifics because that's the language of the English of the time, that all the, that you see in this picture here, the building of fences, the building of houses, owning a piece of property, living on it uh, all year long, and then making, commodifying it to produce food, but also surplus for profit. This is all what the English called improvement, um, you know, changing the landscape to suit the needs of man, which is different than the Wampanoag way of stewarding the land. In other words, allowing nature to provide everything you needed by helping nature in certain ways by burning the underbrush or just keeping things clean so that there was plenty of animals and plenty of food to be produced by nature itself. So very different worldviews coming over. And as a result of English colonization, the land starts to look very, very different and much more reminiscent of the, the America that we see today with fenced out plots and all of these things. So having land did not only mean raising crops for food, it also meant making improvements, the English term for changing the land to suit their needs. These improvements created extra resources which they sold using the concept of currency. At the time, currency came in the form of coins, equally weighted valuable metals. People exchanged their surplus goods for coins or traded good for goods like tobacco. Under this system, people measured wealth by the amount of currency they obtained and kept, as many cultures still do today. The native cultures the English encountered in America did not practice the same system of land ownership by individual people. Instead, many saw their homelands as animate life. The land and waters of native homelands are seen as a system that can be maintained to provide resources for all instead of individuals owning, caring for, and quote-unquote improving a plot of land. Native communities shared ideas of land that new, naturally created all the needed resources for food, clothing, and shelter. These cultures adapted to the most successful life systems for the land they occupied, whether it was fishing, hunting, gathering, farming, or trade. In these systems, maintaining the natural balance of the land, rather than making changes or quote-unquote improvements, had a much higher value. An individual's wealth was not measured by how much currency they accumulated, but by how much they contributed to the life-giving systems that sustained their communities.
So as I said, there's no way I could cover all of the content of this book here, but I wanted to talk a little bit about not just the Wampanoag people, but, you know, there's more than Wampanoag people that live in this region here. And I like, you know, when I wrote this book, I, I really zoomed out beyond the area that we now know as Plymouth or what was previously known as Patuxet and really wanted to bring in all the other tribal regions, their, their, their interconnectedness, how they interacted with one another others. And so this is one of the questions that goes into that. What other people lived in this area? The previous question talking about the Wampanoags. So the entire eastern coastal region, as well as the interior of the continent, was well populated by different native peoples in 1620. The boundaries between the different nations and the villages or communities within them were marked by natural features such as rivers, ponds, hills, or mountains. People respected one another's territories and followed certain protocols when going into other people's homelands. The homelands of a group of people define the language, culture, and way of life. Besides the Wampanoag people, there were several other tribal nations in the region near Patuxet. Above the North River on the coast were the Massachusetts, who associated with the great foothill areas of their homeland. To the west were the Nipmuc peoples, whose name describes their freshwater lake culture in what is now Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and northeastern Connecticut. Along the coast to the south were the Narragansett tribes. Their name comes from the word Nahagansett, which describes the people of the small point from their homeland next to a large and beautiful estuary. So once again, I just wanted to bring more native people to really complicate the history, you know, once again, going beyond the foundational mythology of pilgrims landing and freedom of religion and all of that. There is some truth to that, absolutely, but there is so much more, especially when we add in the complexity of life the science of native peoples, right? And the sustainable way of life that had existed here prior to European colonization without English language improvements for well over 12,000 years without anybody ever starving. So I, I did leave this slide up here. I'm gonna read a little bit more for you. The, it did, uh, the book was well received by reviews uh, from the School Library Journal and Kirkus Reviews, which I was so thankful for as a first book project. I mean, I was shocked. And one of the things I wanted to do once again was create a project that Wampanoag people would be proud to put out as a resource for schools to learn from or for students to learn from or teachers even. I'm proud to say that the Aquina Cultural Center, uh, Wampanoag, one of the federally recognized Wampanoag all communities on Martha's Vineyard um, is actually selling the book and is creating curriculum around it, you know, and the, which is the greatest uh, compliment I could ever get. But a little bit more, uh, you know, from the book, as we go through, I, I like to describe where does this idea of Thanksgiving come from, right? So I'm going to just read a couple of more spots here and then we'll go into the Q&A. But when it comes to the idea of a Thanksgiving, you know, I do go into this into the book. In the 17th century, in England, a Thanksgiving, that word, a Thanksgiving, was actually an English day of prayer and fasting, okay, which is very different than the Thanksgiving meal, you know, which is rep reminiscent of a harvest feast that we celebrate today in America, so how did we get from one to the other, right? You know, so I do describe that in the book, but this is really to give you an idea that the Thanksgiving meal that we uh, celebrate today is actually more reminiscent of native concepts of Thanksgiving that existed, especially with the Wampanoag people. So what was a Thanksgiving for Wampanoag and other native peoples in the region in 1621? The word Thanksgiving evolved out of an old English expression, expression that meant to bestow or grant a grateful thought. Expressions of Thanksgiving exist in all cultures. For the Wampanoag people, Thanksgivings are feasts or ceremonies and occur annually. Events such as the arrival of spring, the new year, the ripening of strawberries, the harvest of corn were cause for celebration and feasting for the Wampanoag complete with dancing and ceremonies. The Wampanoag people and other tribes in the area celebrated these expressions of thanksgiving throughout the year, offering thanks through ceremony, prayer, and sharing food that acknowledges the gifts of the natural world that give people life. 
It is also a reminder of the responsibility of humans to give back to the natural world for what was taken. All Wampanoag life centers around using resources in a way that leaves plenty for the following years. A common tradition when foraging in the woods for food or medicine is to leave the first plants or trees alone for others to find or to save them for next year. In return, Wampanoag people express thanks for the things they take from the woods, whether plant or animal life. Some of these thanksgivings are small observations of prayer or song offered by a single person. Others are large ceremonial feasts, such as the Green Corn Festival celebrated by whole villages in late summer or early fall in honor of the harvest of their largest and most valued crop. The last thing I wanna to read to you is near the end of the book here, because I like to you know, bring once again, uh, you know, uh, native people into the present. The last question I'll read for you is from page 90. What are holidays that honor Native history, right? So we've complicated the Thanksgiving narrative now. And, uh, you know, for Wampanoag people, they actually see it as a day of mourning, right? So different tribes have different histories. And uh, for the Wampanoag people, this was the beginning of uh, the a period of colonization that would result in a long period of genocide against their peoples. And so they actually call the Thanksgiving holiday a day of mourning. Right, so I wanted to leave something, uh, you know, to uh, for readers to have an idea that there are ways to honor Native history, um, and there are actually holidays around that. So this last one is: What are holidays that honor Native history? The United States has no official holiday that honors Native history. However, in 1915, the Congress of the American Indian Association ordered its director, Reverend Sherman Coolidge of the Arapaho people to declare the second Saturday of each May as American Indian Day. They also appealed to make Native people citizens of the United States. To get the day approved, Red Fox James of the Red uh, Blackfoot people rode horseback from state to state getting sign off from state governments. He succeeded in getting 24 states to sign, but the US government never created the holiday. Still, individual states honor native peoples with state holidays, such as American Indian Day, which began in New York in 1916. In the late 1970s, Congress created different laws and presidents made declarations of various days, weeks, or months in honor of the heritage of Native peoples in America. Nothing was permanent. However, in 1990, President George H.W. Bush approved a resolution calling the month of November National American Indian Heritage Month. In 2009, President Barack Obama signed legislation designating the Friday immediately after Thanksgiving Day each year as Native American Heritage Day. The same year, he designated November as Na National Native American Heritage Month in honor of the history and continued existence of America's Native peoples. Another change is a popular unofficial holiday called Indigenous Peoples Day. Indigenous Peoples Day is a response to the Columbus Day federal holiday signed into law into 19, in 1968 that falls on the second Monday of October. Many peoples do not recognize Columbus Day for a multitude of reasons. The biggest reason is that it does not honor Native history, but rather European colonists. Without an official Native holiday, many, many Native nations, local and state governments, began celebrating holidays in honor of Native peoples on the same date as Columbus Day. The first U.S. state to change Columbus Day was South Dakota in 1990 with a holiday called Native American Day. In 1992, the city of Berkeley, California, became the first city to officially replace Columbus Day with Indigenous Peoples Day on their calendar. There are currently eight states with over 130 cities in the U.S. that have officially adopted a, a Indigenous Peoples Day to replace Columbus Day. Other states like California and Nevada celebrate Native American Day and Tennessee celebrates American Indian Day all in the month of November. There's a little bit more to the end of the book there, but I wanted to leave it with that and uh, give some time here uh, for some question and answer. So how did I do time-wise, Bethany? You did great. It, it's perfect. We've got a good, uh, a good 10 minutes to, to have a good chat about this. So we've got 
couple of things coming in the q and A. I I have to say, I, I myself uh, think that that book should be read by everyone, adults included, because there's some wonderful language in there that, it, you know, it's, it's easy to, to have a simple answer to complex questions. I really appreciate that. So I'm going to go get it myself. <laughs> So uh, here's a question. Have you or are you available to visit schools for presentations? And what do you find, my follow-up to that is, what do you find uh, children's reaction to this book is typically like? Yeah, so I've gone into several schools already. You know, the book came out in November, um, which is, you know, for me, you know, as uh, in my line of work, that's my busiest month course um sure. you know but I, I, that's when a lot of the books uh, a lot of the schools were studying the material they had already incorporated it and so i was being invited um you will find that um uh, well i mean there, there's there's two reactions right there's a reaction from the teacher number one because you know the, the way this holiday has been taught you know as the first thanksgiving has been taught that way since the 19th century so it's not just the kids Right. It's the teachers and their parents and their parents. You know, we've been doing this for quite a while here. So oftentimes I get a reaction from the teachers who are enlightened by all of the extra information that was added in, you know, there. And um, the reaction I get from children is that they get to hear so much about the Wampanoag people and that they do not finish the unit wondering if Wampanoag people exist. In fact, they are excited about the idea that not only do they exist, but they actively contribute to the society that we now call the United States of America today. And so even this history, and uh, you know, I, I don't shy away from things like genocide, you know, as, as an effect of colonization, the diseases that came before uh, the landing of, the, of uh, you know, the, the, the Mayflower and things like that. Children can understand that those things are not their fault. They do not internalize, you know, regardless of what grouping they might consider themselves coming from, they don't internalize themselves as that being their fault. What it does is it opens up the window to understanding why things are like they are. So when they go to, you know, uh, especially for the Massachusetts school, if they go to Plymouth, Massachusetts, right? Why don't we pronounce it Plymouth? Right. That's a question a kid has. And it's answered in the book. Right. And there's a, his, there's a history that, you know, and then, and then it's, it's, you know, uh, connected with uh, the honoring of, of Plymouth, England, which was the part the departure point, uh, you know, which is one of the reasons why they chose that name, amongst other things. And then, uh, you know, it, it helps them be critical of tourist attraction things like visiting Plymouth Rock. I don't know if you've ever Plymouth uh, visited Plymouth Rock, right? But that's built off the first Thanksgiving narrative. It's literally a rock they hauled out from the bay and they, they put it in a, um, in a memorial and put the word 1620 on there and people come to visit that. And it's one of the, uh, you know, probably the um, uh, least impressive uh, monuments, you know, we have in this country, um, you know, and it really glorifies that first Thanksgiving narrative in the way it has been taught so you know the students can you know go up to there and wonder okay why is this rock have a monument built around it what where did this come from right and they can be critical about that so what we're trying to do is just really arm them with the information I don't want to leave children thinking you know forcing them to think one way or the other right I just I, I think the facts speak for themselves and that if we arm them with information then they can go forward in this world in so much more informed way and that way when these students at school have a visit to the Plymouth Patuxent Museum and they go to the Wampanoag village there, they don't have that awkward moment where they say, I'm surprised that you guys are still here. And that the, and the interpreter has to, you know, educate them about their existence and all of that. That actually is, is an embarrassing moment for the student that asked the question, you know, because they, 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 at the end, they feel like, oh man, I should have known that. But, you know, the implicit bias of the first Thanksgiving narrative has led them to believe, not nobody has expressly told them that, it's just they've been led to believe that they're only figments of the past. You know, so how do we, you know, get them, you know, uh, inform, you know build them up with, with, with knowledge so that they don't have these awkward, uh, you know, interactions going forward and instead have really involved, you know, and interesting conversations about history and all the good, the bad, and the ugly and be critical of the parts where we as human beings didn't do it right 
right? So that we can think forward together as human beings and make a better future for ourselves together. You just gave the best pep talk to a, a fellow museum professional I think I've ever heard. <laughs> that was wonderful. Thank you. I, I share all of those sentiments. I can see where the New England Museum Association is very lucky to have you. Wow. Uh, very powerful. Okay, we have a uh, question from Christine Malpica. Uh, she is from the Upstander Project. What do you want the biggest takeaway for readers to be from this book about Native Anglo relations, past and present? Um, man, that's that's a big question there. Right? <laughs> you know, because I, I um, like I said, I overdid the the effort. You know, um, Scholastic um, contracted me for eighty five hundred words, and I think my first draft was fifteen thousand words. Um, <laughs> you know, I've been working on this material for a long time. You know, at the Pequot Museum, we get asked about the things we were getting asked about the Thanksgiving holiday commonly, and I created a program called Demystifying Thanksgiving, and I I think. That's probably the, the biggest takeaway is that, you know, the, the, the mythology and the way we have glorified and put this thing, you know, this, this foundational myth on a pedestal and choose not to even question it. Right. You know, uh, you know, ver, you know, I, I'm sure the people in Virginia probably get frustrated as hell when they don't get included as, as part of the origination story of the colony. Right. Right. Um, you know, so uh, uh, the, the one thing I would hope uh, that it does is that it, it erases the, the glorified, um, you know, mythology that we've created around this event, which actually has something to do with the Civil War. The reason why, you know, the foundational myth is at Plymouth in Massachusetts is because the Thanksgiving proclamation was made by Abraham Lincoln during the Civil War. The North, the, the, the tide had turned, the North was winning, and it was going to happen that the North was going to win the war. And President Lincoln is wondering, how do I bring the country together after this, right? But, you know, Sarah Josepha Hale, who was a big part of pushing the, the, the Pilgrim Forefather story and everything like that, got a hold of William Seward, his Secretary of State, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, President Lincoln made a political decision that I'm going to make this Thanksgiving proclamation, and we're going to honor Pilgrim Forefather history in Massachusetts, and we're going to skip over Virginia because that's in the South, right, and the South just lost the war, so we, we are always going to lose the war, so we can't have that foundational mythology that we're all going to come together around happening in the South. It's got to happen somewhere in the North. All right. And, you know, so that's one of the things that I hope that, uh, you know, not just the students, but the teachers get is that there is so much more to the story, you know, and, uh, you know, I include as much as I can, you know, but there's only so far I can get you and that um, to turn to Wampanoag people as the experts in their own history. Um, and that's another thing I, I would actively uh, advocate for as well. Wow. Yep. Critical thinking about everything springs from questioning all the, you know, the narrative that was given to you. I love it. Uh, okay, we've got another question here from an anonymous attendee. Do you distinguish between Brewster and the Pilgrims and John Winthrop and the Puritans who came to Boston from 1830 on? Many people conflate the Pilgrims and Puritans. They were very different, of course, in mission and relationship to the indigenous people. Um, do you have a, do you have any thoughts so about I, that? I don't I don't get into all that. Um, I, there, there is, you know, I, I do mention John Winthrop because, um, you know, there is a Thanksgiving proclamation. As I, as I said, the, the English would proclaim them on any day, and it was usually a celebration of victory in battle. So after the Pequot uh, massacre that happened uh, in 1637, uh, John Winthrop in the Mass Bay colony, in the Puritan colony, uh, not the Plymouth colony, um, uh, would declare that day in May uh, for the next hundred years a day of thanksgiving, a day of prayer and, and, and thanks to God, uh, you know, in, in honor of the massacre of the 600 to 700 Pequots that happened uh, on that day. Um, you know, so there, you know, oftentimes people, you know, will, will say that, you know, an English Thanksgiving, you know, uh, 
uh, they, they conflate the histories and will say that the first Thanksgiving really is, is, is about that massacre when it's really not, you know, so there's two different histories in there. So I do make a mention of John Winthrop so that they understand that that's 1637, not 1621. Um, and that really follows under that, you know, that idea of an English day of Thanksgiving. But I don't get into the differences between the Puritans, uh, you know, uh, in um, uh, the Mass Bay Colony versus, uh, you know, the separatists that were in the Plymouth Colony. I do describe that they were religious separatists, um, you know, and that they wanted to, uh, you know, uh, uh, interpret the Bible in their own way as individuals uh, versus the Puritans, which were, you know, uh, that's where you get the Salem witch trials and all of that, right? You know, and there's a lot of history associated with that. But that's a, that's a whole you know, another 15,000 words. I was going to um, say that that would have blown your word count right out of the water. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. I think we have time for one more question. Here's a good one. In the process of writing the book, did you have children be part of the process, reviewing images and text and giving feedback? Um, well, you know, I um, wrote this during the pandemic. <laughs> so as a result, of, I mean, I created the material, you know, the, the demystifying Thanksgiving program, and I, you know, honed and perfected it by, you know, you know, presenting it many times with children, with, with class, you know, students, native and non-native. Right. So I got to see, you know, uh, you know, different reactions from all different types of, of demographics, you know, and, and the teachers as well. You know, so the material I had already been working with. So I can say the material is definitely child influenced, you know, or student influenced um, and teacher influenced as well. But in the actual process of writing the book. That happened uh, during the pandemic. I was in isolation. I was working at the Abbey Museum and, and my family could not move to the area yet. So I was in, in an apartment by myself. Um, so in the evenings after I got done uh, with my Zoom work, you know, because we were uh, working at home as a result of the pandemic, when I got done with my uh, uh, Zoom work, I would write the book in, in the evenings by myself, basically in isolation, um, you know, but, you know, as I said, Linda Coombs was somebody that, uh, you know, went in and checked my homework very diligently, and she's a hard grader, which is exactly what I wanted, right? I want, if an elder is going to speak, I want them to speak their mind, Absolutely. you know, because I want them to well, I want this book to represent how they feel about the way they speak about their own history. And, uh, you know, so I uh, definitely the material is influenced. But in the process of writing the book, as a result of the pandemic, I was in isolation. And, and a, a, a secret, I have never met my editor, Katie Height, in person. I have never met Winona in person. Uh, you know, so none of the folks at Scholastic, have, uh, any of us, uh, have ever met in person. And in fact, the first Zoom meeting Katie and I had, my editor, um, was uh, in um, a podcast for Scholastic on describing the book. So we didn't even have a Zoom meeting. We did this all by email. Wow. Uh, right. What a world. <laughs> well, I mean, as anyone who has taught a, a museum school you know, education program can tell you, if you can pass muster with a school group, you're good. That's the most uh, that's the best feedback, you know, the on the ground explaining it to children directly in context. That's the best proofing and editing and feedback you can get. So I think that the material will show that as well. Well, I, we are coming to the end of our time. I am so grateful for you to you for appearing uh, on this session of the Newburyport Literary Festival. Um, I hope that you have wonderful success with your film and we look forward to working with you and seeing you again in the future. Thank you again on behalf of all the participants and the Literary Festival. That was a great pleasure. Yeah, and a, a shout out to the Newburyport L Literary Festival. Thank you so much for the invitation. Once again, I'm a, you know new to this uh, writing world, and uh, to be here with all of these great writers as part of uh, of this, I'm just happy to be in the bunch here. So thank you so much for the invitation, and I'm glad uh, for all of you that were here to participate and uh, for the presentation here as well. Well, it's our pleasure, and we I'm sure we will be seeing you again. Thank you again. Have a wonderful day. All right, you too. Bye, everyone.